we're very fortunate to have have these uh, these people here to weigh in, and um, I hope you think carefully about the questions that you that you uh, ask them, just to ask the best questions that you can. Um, I'm going to ask them each to please introduce themselves a little bit, just make a, some brief comments about their their uh, their situation, um, and then we've got some questions prepared, and we will um, go through. Uh, and, and uh, give each one a chance to lead the answer to the question, but then also give everyone a chance to answer it. And then we'll leave um, 25 minutes or so for questions from you all here in the class, and then and then the last 10 or 15 minutes for closing statements from each of the panelists. So, without further ado, please introduce yourselves. Great. So uh, I'm David Kennedy, uh, class of '98 here at the GSB. Um, when I left here, um, I went to management consulting, which I'd done a little bit of prior to business school as well. I'd also had some operating experience, albeit quite light, uh, before business school. Uh, after three years, I did a search fund um, with a partner of mine, a gentleman called Mike Smirklow, uh, who's not here. Um, we bought a company called Service Source. Um, it went pretty well. Uh, we ran it uh, together, and Mike is still the CEO and chairman there now. Um, we ran it jointly for about four years, um, and about three years ago, give or take, I stepped back from that in a kind of minority recap deal, uh, and took a bunch of my chips off the table, um, took some time off, and then founded a private equity firm. So I've kind of been on both sides of the equation here. I've been the search funder, um, and I've also you know, sort of sat on the side of the private equity guys who have dabbled a little bit with the <laughs> sponsored search idea without prosecuting with great vigor. Um, and that's where I am now, a firm called Seren Capital, which I founded with another GSP grad of 98. Yeah. John. Uh, Sean Callahan. Uh, I also was 98 out of Kellogg. Um, I was an operating consultant for about three or f three years before Kellogg. Then went back, did a dual degree program in uh, it was engineering management and business, similar. I think Stanford has one as well. Came out, did management consulting for about a year, um, but quickly sort of decided it was time to go into the operating company. Went into a venture-backed startup. It was a Kleiner-backed startup. Actually, it was with Hal Lee, who was a professor at Stanford. Um, that was probably Series B at the time, so it wasn't true you know, Series A. Uh, but got a good experience there in a growing company. Then stepped out, went to, um, to Oracle, and spent about four years there. I guess about actually about three years. It just seemed like four. Um, and then I, I left and went to Business Engine, which was another venture-backed company, but it was probably Series C, at least, by the time I joined. So it was more of a mid-sized company and growing. I uh, had a, a role of, I was running our sort of sales and business development, and then became the GM of international operations. Um, when the then CEO was, who was a very, very persuasive gentleman, convinced me that it wasn't in that bad of shape. And so uh, he was definitely persuading me, because when I got there, it was. Um, but it's a great experience. Lived in London for a couple of years. Got the international operations in, in better order. The company overall, we, we had a, a good turnaround. Made us appealing. Sold the business in February 2007. Um, I had an employment agreement there until about August of 2007. So it gave me some time to think about what was next. And that's where I sort of started thinking about what we're talking about today. And so when I got back to the States, sort of had teed up, you know, the normal rounds of discussions and sort of looked at taking another GM role. Um, ultimately ended up going with uh, Alpine Investors as a, you know, executive in residence, or you guys call it sponsored search. And so we acquired Y Lighting. I was there for about 11 months before it was acquired. Um, we acquired it on September 5th, 2008. It's sort of high-end modern retailing, if you guys are in the mood for lights or <laughs> furnishings. Uh, about a week before Lehman imploded. So I think some of the things we should talk about is uh, when that investment thesis doesn't turn out to reality. Um, what do, you know, the type of experience you want to have in hand to sort of help you guide through that. Um, been there for about a year, love it, and um, happy to be here. My name. I should note that everybody has, has seen your resume, so if they've read, if they've prepared for the class today, which I'm confident 100% of the people have, well, I'm serious about that, then, then uh, you, but, uh, so you, you can be confident of that. I'm very trusting, so I'll be pithy. Um, <laughs> I, like David, am from Dublin, Ireland originally. Um, like David, followed him to Russia at some point in time, and then, of course, followed him over here. Um, and then I met him. And, of course, <laughs> Ireland being a small country, you know, we know some similar people. Um, I did a search fund coming straight out of school, looked at doing some other entrepreneurial stuff, 
did talk to some folks about the sponsored search and ultimately decided to go the search fund route with a partner. And we've been operating the business for close on five years. And one of the interesting things, like many search funds, our buyout has somewhat morphed into a startup. Um, so here we are, eight years out of business school, and we're running a startup, and running very hard and fast, and we've got an exciting growing company. Okay, I'm Michael Sanabria, and uh, I class 93, so I started uh, about 10 years after I graduated doing a search fund. So for me, I always knew I wanted to do something entrepreneurial, and so the choices I made, both in terms of choosing Stanford <laughs> And then after Stanford, the kind of operational decisions I made, going to Apple as a product manager, and uh, so on and so forth, going to increasingly smaller companies, were all targeted to address some of the things that you guys brought up, which is to get that operational experience that I thought would help me successful. So I waited about 10 years until I joined a company uh, in Nevada, and then decided that it was time to go out and do a search. And at that time, I chose the self-funded search model, and uh, been with the company now about seven, seven years will be this year. Great. So I'm going to start off with some questions. Um, you know, just in, in following the discussion today in class, I'll, the first question I'll ask is, is and I'll, Mike, I'll ask you to, to answer it first if I could, but then if each of you would, please, that'd be very helpful. What do you see as the biggest benefits to the acquisition path to entrepreneurship? And, and what do you see as the biggest risks? Um, so for, for me, the, the question is, it's, uh, it, it depends. For, for me personally, when I started this search, I had a pretty good idea. Well, not a pretty good idea. I knew the industry I wanted to go into. I knew basically the idea that I wanted to pursue. And so for me, the benefit of going to an acquisition was I wasn't trying to uh, create some new way of creating RAM. Um, it wasn't a, a high technology solution. It was very blocking and tackling. I was going into a very mature industry where I felt I could bring some strategic channel partnerships and a customer-centric focus to sales and marketing. And I didn't need to, I felt like by acquiring a going concern that had uh, folks with industry experience, ongoing operations, I could bring my ideas and uh, get that more quickly than going out and starting from, from, from scratch. So for me, the benefit was being able to look for the type of company that um, had what I needed uh, but was missing what, it, what I felt I could bring and then add value through that. Um, the, the downside in my particular model of going self-funded was um, I, I, you, know, you find yourself a, l a little lacking perspective and expertise in terms of not so much the operational side, but probably the, the deal side. And uh, when you're going self-funded, there are a lot of resources I called upon. A lot of classmates had done similar things, so that was a good thing for me. But um, there's a limited amount of time that they're willing or able to spend, and uh, so that was probably something that hurt me. And then the, the two big things, the downside were in terms of acquisition was the, the baggage can become pretty overwhelming. Some of you mentioned that. Um, when you get inside, I spent a lot of time early on overcoming some cultural issues that were pretty tough to identify in the search and acquisition phase. But I spent a lot of time with those once I actually bought the company. And then the, uh, the last thing were in sort of the acquisition is, is uh, discovering those rotten Easter eggs, things that just were hidden below the surface um, that hit you. Uh, and uh, you know, so you have all these great plans, what you're going to do in the first 100 days. And then you come in and you find things that um, you were completely unexpected that all of a sudden divert your energy and attention. Okay. Kieran, how about you? What are the biggest benefits and risks of, of uh, the acquisition path? I don't know if they're the biggest ones, but um, some that you know come to mind here as we're sitting. Um, it, it's it's a it's definitely an entree into entrepreneurship. You know, I didn't I'd had ideas before, and just the timing didn't work out. Um, uh, I was in um, the UK in '93, having come back from the States for the first time, and was trying to sell everyone on coffee in a paper cup, telling them it was going to be huge, and I couldn't convince a soul. Um, and I knew nobody in business, and I knew nothing about business. Um, and I had long hair and a guitar, and it just wasn't going my way. <laughs> and I figured I got to learn something about business. Well, you know, several years later, the coffee thing sort of panned out a little bit, and I didn't have that next idea. Uh, I had some that I thought were okay, and I wanted to build 
a great business and this was how I was going to do it. Um, it was an, um, so it, it's an, it's, it's a route. Um, one thing, one benefit of the acquisition path that's not being mentioned here today, I think, is if you get into a company of the right scale and the right size and that is decent, frequently, actually, bizarrely, um, a lot of the skills that you gain in this room can be of more benefit um, than in a smaller company. I think it was, uh, Jason, you were commenting on smaller, you, mu you might feel more control over the thing. But if you get into a larger company, I frequently think you might have some decent management under you um, who can look after the day-to-day -day tactical, and you may be of some benefit in thinking through strategic issues, um, which people in this room are more teed up for. Um, I saw in Michael's write-up that he suffered, like I did, from not having decent management under us. So you're dragged into the uh, tactical. Um, so I think, actually, acquisition path, if you get into the right sort of vehicle, it can really tee you up. Um, it's a great model if you get a good company, <laughs> um, but it, it, that's a big if. Um, biggest risks, um, being mentioned several times, you're inheriting someone else's problems um, and someone else's team and culture, which aren't necessarily positive things. If Dave Dodson, I remember impressing this upon, upon us, um, if you get into a bad industry or an industry where the tide just isn't going the right way, that's, that's just not fun. You can push against the tide for a while, but if the industry is not going the right direction, it's tough. And then finally, the biggest risk, um, I think, ultimately, is time. You can spend a lot of time um, just not moving quickly enough. So I, I think it was Jessica talked about figure out if you're going to fail or not. Um, you know, if you're in a bad industry or you're in a bad company or if you're going to fail, I'd like to do it a lot faster. You know, one of my mantras in the company now is let's move faster, let's fail faster. You know, talking to the salespeople, get no's faster, um, speed up that sort of what's going to take place. Thank you. So a little bit, of, again, um, I'm going to start with Michael's. It depends. Uh, you know, I think that's the great thing about this class is it's not right or wrong, um, you, but we're going to tee it up for you. The um, why I acquired personally versus founded is, you know, I, I took a lot of the entrepreneur class when I was in school, did new product competitions, really loved the idea of starting my own company, but I never had a killer idea. I think if I had a killer idea that I really had passion about, maybe I would have taken that route, but I didn't. Um, but what I did have passion about was creating an organization that could be lasting, that could really, really grow. And so I, I love the idea of setting a vision, getting a team aligned against that vision and really growing that business, which is going to make you, you know, successful, I think, in business. But it also just, I, I have passion about doing that, which you, know, you brought up about. So very much so, that can happen in any of these three models. And for me, that was one of the criteria, because I don't want to spend seven years of my life on something I don't have passion about. I think life's definitely too short for that. Um, but, you know, again, why do the, the through acquisition versus startup? I do enjoy, because of that, I enjoy building off a base and having, um, uh, <laughs> as it turns out, there wasn't a whole lot of vision when I, you know, got into the company. Even though it was a $3 million EBITDA business, good-sized business, um, didn't mean it had a good vision. It uh, meant they did some things right. Uh, it didn't mean they had a management team, as it turns out. They didn't. Um, but there's a lot of things you can work with. And so you get to work those, those, those tools uh, if, you're, you know, if you feel good about the, the management skills. So that, that's been great. I mean, and just the idea of you get to, um, to go through the process of trying to find a company buy. I uh, learned a lot there, even though I had done that a few times, but for a company, not really, you know, which I was going to end up running. Uh, learned a lot of things through that process, which I'll take with me through the rest of my career. Um, then, you know, obviously you get a chance to run a company. Which, um, which, you know, Jesse, you said this at this point in, in your career, uh, that's an interesting opportunity. Uh, and you have to decide sort of when you're ready. Because I know the CEO of Business Engine, which was the, you know, the job I took b before this, um, he was my age. We, we actually graduated from Kellogg together. He was ready to be a CEO after four years um, out of business school. I wasn't at the time. I, but I tell you, when I walked out of being the GM, I felt ready. Like, I felt like, uh, Victor, you mentioned it's like, You've got a team of people who, uh, whose lives you, you, know, you, you play a big role in. I mean, you've got to do the right things for the company, which sometimes are hard decisions. At the end of the day, though, I wanted to feel like I was ready to lead that before I was going to take that, take that on. So I think that it's a wonderful opportunity, and it just felt as a natural next career step for me, given I, I didn't have a, a, a killer product idea. Uh, the risks, you know, we've talked about this before, but I, I think 
Um, you could spend two years looking, let's say towards the tail end of that, you close the deal, four or five years running it, um, and it, let's say it's, it's a zero, it's a donut. I mean, great personal life experiences, but you know, if, uh, if you're seven years out of business school and that's, that's your post-graduation um, post, you know, track, there, there's some concerns there I think are, are valid ones to really think about. I think for me at least, I felt like it's gonna be, um, it's gonna be a natural career path for me, so I'm kind of mitigating that risk. So not just financially, but career-wise. Um, I'll leave it there. Great, thank you. And David, the biggest benefits in, um, of the acquisition path to entrepreneurship and the biggest risks? So I think the reason that I did it, um, which for me was the biggest benefit of the lot, was just the ability to control my own destiny. Um, I, I felt you know, I, I'd worked for big companies, I'd worked for consulting firms and through them for other big companies. And I felt like, you know, I kind of wanted to, instead of be the person on the sidelines who's coaching people, taking the shots, I wanted to be the guy with the ball in my hands in the last sort of 60 seconds of the game and be able to make things happen. And I felt confident in my ability to really drive um, performance. And, and I thought that I should gain the, the benefits of that, both the psychic and the financial. And, you know, I wanted to earn the marginal product of my labor, if you want to put it in economic terms. Um, but the reality is I, I, I felt like I could control things and, and that I had learned enough and I was ready and, and I really wanted that control and that autonomy. And so, so that was the reason that I did it. Um, and for me, this was a, you know, I think the benefits, it's benefits versus what. And, and for me, I, I didn't have a great startup idea. Maybe I might have done a startup at the time had I had a great idea. But for me, it was versus being a GM of, of a division for a large company, maybe working with a private equity firm with their portfolio companies. Those were things that, that were possibles for me that I explored as I, you know, kind of decided to take the leap to do a search. Um, I think in retrospect, the risk that, because I'm, always, I'm often in an unusual situation when I sit in these panels because I did the search fund, it went very well, and I think it was a dumb idea, um, and I wouldn't do it again. Um, and so let's get that out on the table straight away. Um, the, the, the reason, and, and I, the reason that I, I feel that way is because I think the risks, to your point, Peter, are, are large, and I think um, particularly they're non-diversifiable risks. Um, you know, the fact that the bulk of search funds don't work. Um, you know, they either don't buy a company, or if they do, they lose money for their investors, or, you know, even, in fact, I think the worst of all scenarios is you buy something and you chug along for five, six, seven, eight years, and you make no money for anybody, and your career is in tatters, um, and you haven't made any cash at all, you haven't been paid terribly well, and you look at your peer group that's out there from the search side of things, and they're flying. You know, they're CEOs of things now, or GMs of things now, or what have you, and it's got, at least as I can tell, having been fortunate enough to be in the top kind of decile quartile of search fund returns got nothing to do with us. I mean, I don't think we're particularly stupid, but I don't think we're particularly smart either when I look at my peers who did search funds. And I think most folks who come to Stanford have always been the top decile of anything they've ever done or top percentile. And they hear that, you know, top decile does great in search funds and they're like, sign me up, I'm gonna be top decile. And, and the reality is these small businesses have massive risk that's really hard to tell before you buy. They have usually significant customer concentration, uh, particularly because you're typically buying small, fast-growth businesses, what you tend to do is something's got proof of concept, they've got a couple big customers, you hope you're going to take it from a couple to 20, or from 10 to 100, or, or whatever it ends up being, and hey, the customers change their mind, your customer merges, it gets bought, it goes bankrupt. Um, there's a set of things that are just endemic to small business that are highly risky, and to me, in retrospect, that risk is kind of twofold. I mean, the, the first one is, you know, there's just a, so there's just a financial economic set of risks that go along you know, kind of with this process. And the, the second one, though, which is kind of a, sort of a harder one to articulate is, what's the risk that you're not actually ready to be a CEO? And what's the risk to your career of the fact that you've now jumped into that position, which, as people sort of jokingly refer to, makes you constitutionally unemployable to do anything other than be a CEO? And you never learned how to be a CEO properly. Um, you never learned how to bring in revenue. You never learned what it's like to make a quarter and to lose a quarter. You never learned what it's like to build a team well or to build a team badly, to fire people. Um, you never learned those things properly because you never had a mentor, you never went to a well-run company, you popped into a $2 million EBITDA business and you struggled there for a while and it's still a two, $3 million EBITDA business and you never learned the, you know, you never apprenticed to the, to the skill set of, of being a great manager. Um, and so to me, those are, those are kind of the, you know, those are the core risks that, that, that are associated with doing the search. Thank you. The class is not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I think this, 
the experience of this panel highlights really a lot of the things that we talked about today and the things that we're going to explore in the next two weeks. So to keep going, um, why, let's see, why did you, why did it make sense for you to try this approach at the point in career, point in your career where it did? You kind of answered that already, each of you, but I'll, I'll go and actually shift and Karen, if you'll, uh, if you'll go next and I'll try and keep in this order of shifting the first question to the next. So why did it make sense at that point in your career? Sure. Um, so probably coming off of that Starbucks experience, I, I went out trying to get some business skills. And I specifically went, um, long story, but I ended up in Russia knocking on doors of Western institutions looking for uh, business experience and didn't care how I got it. Ultimately, there came a point when um, I'm in New York, I'm in consulting, it's in the dot-com times when everyone's knocking your door saying, hey, come work for us. Um, and there's lots of money to be made and I was, got the promotion past the MBA hurdle and it turns out I was really good at this consulting gig and life could be easy doing this. Um, and it wasn't what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to go build companies. Uh, and I think um, Sean sort of described it pretty well. It, it's it, this personal fulfillment, um, and th that's what I wanted. Um, and you know, part of it had come through that Starbucks thing. Part of it had come, I, I grew up in Dublin when it was huge unemployment. I, mean, I think 18% was the typical. Um, where I grew up, lots of unemployed fathers, and I say fathers because typically the mothers weren't working until the father got unemployed and they'd go looking for a cleaning job or something. And I knew from the uh, factories where my parents worked that um, good managers could make a huge difference. And I saw the standard of management that was out there in the average company. I was like, I can make a difference. Um, so there was this twofold motivation. Um, but so I'm 27, and I'm in New York, and I'm thinking, I don't need this huge money. I want to build something. Um, I'll either start something now, or if this place, Stanford, will have me. They seem to spit out entrepreneurs. I'll go out there and see what that can top me off with. Well, this place had me, so that was nice. I came out here. And I got two years of discussing pros and cons and hearing to a lot of, of bright people. And that was wonderful. Built a great network. But ultimately, I was ready and I was chomping at the bit. And I did believe there's a lot that I just didn't know. I, I sort of knew I didn't know. I, I wish I could surround myself with more smarter folks. But um, it's in the case today. I mean, the first three things Christian and I had to learn were um, selling, leading, and managing. And we're not done with that. I mean, the, the, the speed of, I met Joel Peterson out in the parking lot, the speed of learning has only accelerated um, since leaving school and continues to do so. And in terms of, um, there's, there's, we've had some luck. I mean, we've had some bad luck, perhaps, that maybe we weren't kicked out of the game early on and gone and done something else. We persisted onwards. We've had the good luck that we found something else and, um, and we're, we're running on that hard. Um, but it was just, I, was, I felt that readiness. That's it. I just felt it and I wanted it. And there are risks there. And, and those risks are pretty subjective because um, I, I think David's right that looking at your peer set, the green-eyed monster can really chew you up when I compare myself with uh, you know, the couple of classmates who are driving the Lamborghinis from the choice of cars in the big parking lot at their house. Um, and there are some of those guys. Um, but it, that's not what I want to do. I want to build something. Um, so that's why. What about you, Sean? Is there, you mentioned, you talked a little bit about how you got in your career to that point. Is there, is there uh, um, anything else to why you picked that point versus another point in your career to do it? So I really just I felt ready in, in my gut to, that it was time that, that I could lead a company successfully versus being a GM, which was a great training. But it is different when you don't have that CEO to sort of go to and um, sometimes to tell you you can't do things when you were like, because now, you know, you still have the board. By the way, the board can be positive even in a sponsored search. Um, hopefully we'll have time to talk about. But I, I just, I, I was ready, and so I didn't feel like, frankly, it was as big of a risk as it, it would have felt to me before. Um, and we can talk about why. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But I, um, David hit on a lot of the points. I, it wasn't the strategy experience. There's a lot, of, I, I can assure everybody in this room is very, very smart and probably pretty strategic thinkers. It was having a number having to hit that thing every quarter or not hit it, figure out how to conjure up 
the revenues to hit that, right? Build a team. It was that kind of stuff that really, I felt comfortable in my own skin at this point managing people. Um, and that's what gave me the confidence. It wasn't that I could outthink the next person. David, you said you sort of felt ready to. You were just prepared to. Would you add anything to that? or? Yeah, I, I, well, I think in retrospect, I wasn't. Um, <laughs> I, I thought I was, you know? And, and so um, the, the way that I think about timing is, um, I, th I think that this is an inherently kind of risky thing. And so if you're going to do it, that's fine. You're going to take on risk. It's like everything else you do when you take on risk. You then work out how do you minimize the chances that things will go badly. And also, if things do go badly, you, you know, kind of hope for the best and plan for the worst. That's what CEOs do all the time. Um, and sort of given that, I would do it, if I were doing it all again and wouldn't want to do it, I'd do it when Sean did it. I'd do it having been a GM somewhere. I'd, I'd do it having had all of that experience because I think you're far better off. We, we screwed up a bunch in the first couple of years because we were learning how to do the job. Uh, and in retrospect, that didn't kill us. And it certainly probably left some money on the table. Um, but it didn't kill us. And, but I'd be far better off having done it, having had, the, you know, having had some sort of general management experience. And then secondly, as I said, I, I think if it all goes pear-shaped, which can happen, um, you need an exit strategy. And, and I think to the extent that you have built a brand and you've built a set of skills and a network through having a strong operating career prior to doing it, you're in far better shape than you are when you, know, you do it sort of straight out of business school, or I did it you know, business school plus McKinsey, which is you know, it's a little bit better than straight out of business school, but I think not a lot. Um, and so, um, you know, at some point when that fails, if you've, you know, tried to buy something and you finally buy it, and to Sean's point, you're like seven years in at some point, you're no longer kind of somebody who worked at Goldman Sachs and TA Associates and has a, you know, Stanford MBA. You're now just some guy who, you know, kind of ran a company kind of badly for half a decade and, you know, has spent seven years of their career making no money for anybody. Um, and I think you want someone to fall back on it. Preferably, that's a really successful GM experience prior to doing it. Is your comment about three years at McKinsey not being much different a comment on, on the nature of the work? It, it is. I, I, look, I had a great time at McKinsey. I think it's a fantastic firm. It's a wonderful consulting experience. I'm totally with Sean. What makes a difference in being ready to do this stuff? It's having to bring in a number. And it's having to manage a team of folks. And it's having to hire. And it's having to fire. And it's, it's the things that general managers do all the time. And you don't learn at business school. And you don't learn in consulting. Um, and I think that set of skills is just, it's invaluable. And it's just hard to do any way other than through apprenticeship, I think. Michael? Uh, so, so it's clear we're all in violent agreement about the operational experience and managing people and all that stuff. So, so what I'll focus on instead is what, what was key for me after 10 years is I had a much better perspective and idea of what I wanted. And so in part why I chose self-funded versus the traditional or sponsor, sponsored model, I, I had a pretty clear idea of the end game. And for me, the end game wasn't to buy a company, flip it, and retire in five years. Uh, I'd gone through, um, I graduated in 93. Uh, little something called the Netscape browser was launched around that time. And I lived through that entire boom and bust. And, and to echo what David said, I saw a lot of really smart people make nothing out of it. And I saw a lot of really not so smart people um, pick the right company at the right time and make a lot of money. And, and it kind of wasn't, there wasn't any rhyme and reason around how hard you worked. Um, there was a lot of timing. There was a lot of luck. And so, so I had a pretty clear idea that, that now my end game, my time, I knew what I wanted. And it was I wanted to go out, buy a company, build a company. And I expected and fully expected that was something I was going to be with for 15, 20 years. My goal was to generate income. My goal was to get it big enough to kind of step back and just play a strategic role day to day, but still stay engaged. Because after 10 years, I realized that was still important to me. Um, I can't conceive of a world where I just retire and do nothing. I want to stay engaged. I want to be, you know, uh, still stimulated by something important and meaningful that I've built. So, so for me, what was key is I had a very clear idea of, of what I wanted and what I expected to get out of it. And so that's what made it the right time for me. Thank you. Uh, the next question I'd like to put to you for is, and um, Sean, I'll start with you, is, is how did you attract, attract your investors? To your, to your search fund. In your case, I guess, it was Alpine, so it was, a, it was different, but it's, they didn't just magically appear. How, d how did you attract them? And then I'll ask the others. Uh, so coming out of Northwestern and even after that, I wasn't, um, I guess, aware of the entrepreneurship through acquisition, the search fund. Uh, so I just knew what I was trying to do. 
And so when I knew I had that six months after we sold the company, I started reaching out to, to people I knew back in the States. And you know, uh, I, I, was I knew I wanted to be at a growing company, like mid-size, not venture capital. I'd worked for two venture-backed companies, and I, that wasn't for me. So I, anyways, I just started whittling down the, the private equity firms that I thought sort of were investing in middle market companies that were in sort of the criteria, the type of company I'd like to work with. That, that's how I went about it. Um, I also worked for GM roles. I got to hedge my bets because I was bringing home a wife, a kid, and a dog. Uh, so, you know, ha had to start looking. So, I, I really, the, uh, that was what I did and tried to be thorough about it and talk to people. You know, you guys call it informational interviews. Uh, I learned a lot along the way and just kind of naturally came to a point where um, the Alpine folks were investing in the types of businesses I was looking for or thought I was looking for because I wasn't picking an internet retailer going in. Um, and I trusted them. And, you know, we talked a lot about the, the board control issues, and those are very real. Um, and I, I think those are very real in any of these, you know, scenarios. So, anyways, uh, I, I just felt a good trust for them, which really made it a pretty easy decision for me. And they were, you know, crazy enough to bring me on board. Thank you. Yeah, how, you how did you and Mike attract investors in three weeks? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it was three weeks because we spent a bunch of time kind of pre-marketing before we went out to sell. So, so that number... I was kind of a little uncomfortable with it kind of going out there. The reality is I'd been thinking about and talking about doing a search for two years, uh, three years. And so, you know, I already knew a whole bunch of folks, um, including a couple of folks you're going to have in the class here on Thursday who are just super people who, who helped me out through that process with Will and, uh, with Will and Bill. Um, I, I think it's, that's a little bit tied to me with the question of what are you looking for with your investors, if you will. So I'm going to kind of answer both, if that's okay. Um, I, I liked the sort of set of things we had up there. But particularly the, the fact that dollars is first is, is pretty important. And it should be first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and then, you know, somewhere around sixth, you can start talking about other things. Um, the, what, what we ended up doing was we sort of decided, first of all, we, we built a list of, I think, literally 200 people that we thought might plausibly be search fund investors for us. Then we worked through who had real deep pockets. And, and for us, that meant that they would be prepared to put, of the order of a million bucks, in cash into one single deal. Um, because we wanted to have the ability to put $15 million in equity and we only wanted to have 15 investors. And then we kind of rank ordered them based on kind of two criteria, one of which was how well do they know the search fund and comfortable will they be in investing in this model? And the other one was how well do they know us? And folks that were both, so who knew us well and who understood this model, we prioritized first and we quickly got five of those folks who, who, who all had deep pockets. Um, and again, some of this was, I'd been talking to some of these folks forever. I'd been, you know, I'd worked at a company, which was a search fund company, a very successful one, and the two founders were both sort of prepared to sponsor me through my search effectively and make introductions for me. Um, Mike, similarly, through his career, had had, you know, had done some fantastic things for a couple of very wealthy, highly respected deal people. They wanted to back him. And so suddenly, within about, you know, within a couple of days, or pre-launched, if you will, we had five of the 15 taken with folks who were real name investors who had real money, knew us really well, and so it, 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 it meant a lot when we go to other people and we say, it's X, and they know who X is, and they know that X knows us really well. Um, and that just made it so that much easier. When you get both of those cross sections of know you and know the search, and they're well-respected people as well with, with sort of deep pockets, and from then on, it just sort of, it, it, it quickly ran through. Um, from each of those folks that said yes, we sort of said, hey, can you suggest another set of folks that you think would be truly great investors? And so we went down it like that. The other thing that we did was we were very careful about trying to make sure that we had no concentration of power in our search fund. And there's a, there's a theme that came through the class that I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about in a second, which is control and autonomy on the one hand, and then the flip side of which, which is support and involvement from an investor on the other. Mike and I were decidedly on one end of the extreme that said we want to be able to control our destiny entirely. And that means we want a completely fragmented set of people investing in us. We don't want anybody who's going to actually uh, own more than one unit, and we don't want anybody who's going to be able to drive the decision of whether or not we buy the company. If we like the company, we want to be able to force it through. Um, and so the private equity funds, for example, that might plausibly have invested in us, and there were a few, we talked to when we were basically already sold. Uh, that way we had relationships such that when we found the company, if we had a gap, we could go back to those private equity funds and raise the slug of four million or five or six or seven or whatever was required to finish off the acquisition. And we'd formed relationships with them that were solid from that perspective. We didn't have to, you know, talk to them we'd only three units sold and then subsequently tell them to get lost. We told them, hey, we've only got one unit left, might you be interested? Oh, terribly sorry, somebody else just took it. Um, and that was kind of the order in which we sort of thought about it. So we were very thought around the order in which we hit up those, those, those sets of folks. Thank you.
I was looking again, I was doing very specific industry search, and so for me, I was looking for investors who brought one. Um, I, I'm a manufacturer, so I was looking for distributors who could bring me sales, and so I went out talking to people that could actually invest in me and then turn around and have their companies um, funnel sales to my company. Um, the second thing I was looking for was prior relationships. I had spent a lot of time dealing with venture back company boards and, and saw that uh, what, they, what they don't provide, I, I have to smile when I hear some of the things you guys are looking for um, from investors because the, the reality is, is um, they don't have a lot of time for you. Uh, they, they want the numbers, that's what they care about. Um, they really can't spend or don't choose to spend that much time understanding your business, so you, you're not going to get a lot of insight out of them. So I wasn't looking for people necessarily who were going to provide operational experience or things of that nature, um, but I wanted people that I had a relationship with me so that they went into the deal with a, with a basis and a foundation of trust and then I could, felt I could grow from there. So uh, the, the one thing that you mentioned that I wish should have done differently is probably a third really important thing would have been uh, people had deeper pockets because I chose people who um, you know, kind of put the limit of what they would invest in any one opportunity. And then when I came back to them later with acquisition opportunities and I needed uh, more powder, uh, they really weren't there for me. Uh, they, it was kind of like, oh, let's see what we can do. Let's, let's go to a bank. Uh, let's try other avenues. And that, and that hurt because they were in the best position. They weren't unhappy with my performance. They weren't unhappy or they didn't, it wasn't initially believing the ideas. Is sort of they had already given as much as they were willing to give. And I probably should have uh, looked at that follow-on investment as a more important uh, component of who I chose. Um, so on the question of how we attracted our investors, uh, when we went out looking for money, it was about a year after David went out, and uh, we went out in June 2002. And since uh, I knew of three search funds who went out summer of 01, we went out summer of 02. Well, clearly 9-11 had happened, and the Dow went into a free fall. So when we started raising money in the middle of June 02, the Dow was at 9-7. And by the time we closed our fund, it was at 7-6. So it meant that everyone who ought to have liquid assets to invest in us we, we really had to sort of twist their arms and twist a lot of other stuff with some pretty brutal implements. Um, it, but it was, it was a classic sales process. And someone said uh, here, you know, what do you take away from the, um, the two-year process or that whole process of looking for money? I think it was Victor. Um, no? OK. What do you take away from the process of looking for money and then going looking for a deal? There's lots of skills. I mean, it's not the ones I wanted. Yeah, I wanted to get in and run a business. but. We got really good at running a sales process. So, you know, first of all, you know, you've got to come up with a value proposition. There's lots of people out there looking for money in this brutal time, so you've got to come up with how you're different. And when you're going in front of a lot of people, your pitch really starts to hum. Um, in terms of the process, I think that's what we were really good at. We didn't know people. We just didn't. Uh, uh, we got a spreadsheet, and we wrote down 70 names when we started. And we actually wrote a white paper, and I think the CES has this. A lot of search funders who are looking for money today are passing this around, but we wrote down 70 names, and nine months later we had 1,070 names on it. And we sat down up face to face with over 200 people, and from that 200 people we ended up getting, I think in the search fund, something like 25 people, which isn't an ideal number at all. It's way too high. Um, but it, you know, back to David's point, it's the dollars. And we were actually looking for experienced dollars. We were looking for folks who'd run businesses and who could be value-add. Um, by the time we did our deal, because it was such a bad time for raising money, we had 44 people in the deal. And all of those additional people had come from people we'd hit up along the way. Uh, but in terms of the sales process, it was that calling people, um, saying, hey, tell them what we're doing, tell them what we're trying to achieve. And when they try to shut you off the phone, you give them a reason why they ought to be talking with you on the phone. And ultimately, what you're looking for is two names. Because if you can get two names from um, everybody, you're still alive. Um, so I certainly know that I didn't know Sean at the time, and I didn't know Lisa at the time, but Jim, we hounded per Jim. Um, we hounded per Peter. We definitely hounded David. We, we hounded everybody for names, and, and that's how we did it. It was classic, just pure, grinded sales process. Uh, so you were all successful in buying a company. Um, and David, I think this is yours, yours to start with. Um, how was the experience of actually operating it different than what you expected? Um, 
Well, I think in a, you know, in, in a few different ways. As I said, I, I think one of the things I, you know, one of the things I discovered quickly was that I wasn't as good as I thought I was, um, and that there were a set of skills that I was learning for the first time. Um, and as a result, we messed up. Um, we messed up with some of our hiring, um, with some of our critical hires. Uh, we messed up in managing, I think, our sales process some. Um, we messed up with some of our key, key accounts in terms of account management. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the first things I learned was the fact that there were a set of skills that we were missing. Um, and so that was kind of different. Um, I think, secondly, we had, and this is sort of similar to the last conversation, but we had pulled together what I still think of as being a phenomenal board of directors for a typical search fund business. We had four smart, experienced, committed folks sitting on the board who had great alignment with us and were relationship type of people. And yet, the board experience was a curiously unsatisfying one for us because kind of to, you know, to, to, to what's already been mentioned actually by I think almost everybody on the panel, a set of folks who otherwise have careers and jobs and are doing, you know, important things and who are managing partners at firms or who are professors at the GSB or whoever it is, just had very limited time. And so you'd come into board meetings, we found, and very quickly it turned into, how did you do over the last 90 days? And we said, we did great. And they'd say, congratulations, do it again. Um, and, <laughs> and that was basically, you know, that was kind of what our board meetings started to turn into relatively quickly. And again, that's not to knock our board because it was a fantastic set of folks, but you know what are they going to do? They're busy working the other 90 days, you know, in the quarter. Um, and one of the things that we did do was we took on um, a venture firm after about 18 months who didn't actually invest in the company. They just bought shares from the, some of the existing folks. And we did it deliberately to kind of raise the game. Um, not the quality of the board members, because I don't think the quality moved. I think it just stayed extremely high. But we now had somebody whose actual job it was um, that we do well. Um, and who, as a result, came on sales calls and got to know members of our executive team a lot better and became somebody that you could talk to on a daily basis without feeling like you were being a pain in the backside um, by calling them. Um, and so, I, you know, I think those are kind of the, the two pieces. One, that we weren't as good as we thought we were and that we were kind of, you know, ready to screw up. And then secondly, well, therefore you need assistance. We didn't really 100% get it from our board, and that's not to knock them. It's just you know, the difference between having a professional set of investors who have real skin in the game on what you're doing as opposed to um, folks who are doing it as a hobby was, was pretty marked. So they were can can you give us one war story from early on of something that didn't said hiring, sales, key accounts? So, <laughs> yeah, so the, I mean, I think the best one of the lot was we, we, um, we invested just a huge amount of time in getting a, a VP of sales. Um, and for us, this was a company-making hire, uh, as far as we were concerned. And we hired um, an individual who just had a glowing resume and who had ended up being president of a multi-billion dollar public company um, and had driven sales at a couple of technology companies extraordinarily successfully, well, multiples larger than our company was at that point. Um, and we had to fire him within two weeks of hiring him um, for a variety of reasons I won't go into. And having agreed with our board that this was a key hire and having negotiated an unbelievable compensation and option package for this person to have to go back in 14 days later and say, I'm terribly sorry, we screwed up, we've got to fire this guy. That was a pretty big one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. So uh, you know, for me, it was a, a, the biggest deviation was I, I came from high tech. I came from an industry where my peers, the people that I worked for, the people that worked for me, um, you know, had a minimum of a, uh, a, an undergraduate degree. Many of them had advanced degrees. And so all that operational experience and supervisorial experience and all those things, that, that was great. But then when, for me, I bought a manufacturing organization where people were hourly, uh, blue collar, it became a very different management experience. And so fortunately, I had um, the experience to kind of deal with it, but, but you, you're just dealing with a whole different set of issues, um, a different way to motivate people. It's, it's very different to motivate people um, in, in my industry and, and than it was in, in high tech where everyone had, uh, you know, equity and shares and um, options and, and it, it did all the right things for the right reasons. Um, so those were the things that for me deviated a lot was, was going from one environment to the other, thinking I had transferable skills, which I think for the most part worked out, but just the different set of issues, operational issues, when I chose to, to, to move so far from uh, between industries. Thank you. How about you, Karen? 
How's their experience very deviated from what you expected? From what I expected. Um, someone mentioned here uh, they really wanted to manage people. Um, can't remember who that was. Um, the bizarre thing is I meet so many business owners who are like, crap, I hate managing people. This is hell. <laughs> Get rid of these people. Um, it, it's bizarre. I never understood why search funders, like the guys who worked in private equity firms, would write down in their books one of their key ratios in, in, in um, sort of ascertaining the quality of a business is the revenues per employee. It's like, I'm like, who cares if it's 70,000 or if it's 700,000? Um, the reality is it's a lot easier to run a business when it's 700,000 per employee than 70,000. Um, managing people's really hard. Um, and um, just that's probably the biggest thing by far. I just way underestimated. Um, and uh, what else? Um, lack of, I, I've written down here, we're just under leveraged. And I think this goes to David's uh, experience thing of, you know, today I'd know going into a business, crap, I don't care what this is doing to the cash flow, we got to get in a more leveraged management team here today. We need to make differences immediately. I'd know going into a deal that I need to raise an extra half a million from the investors so that in order to do these things, rather than try and keep the investment to the minimum possible. Um, in terms of the under leverage, there's, you know, the ma that lack of tactical management um, or other executives, um, the difference in workforce. You know, you start to employ, you know, college grads from nice colleges and it starts to really make a difference in the sort of ex your daily experience, uh, my daily experience. Another thing on lack of experience, you know, David mentioned getting rid of a VP of sales after two weeks. It took us nine months. That's our lack of experience. Um, you know, we just should have taken the guy out back, shot him very quickly. It didn't <laughs> happen. Um, by the way, uh, one, one sort of uh, business group I'm in, the chair was asked recently, do you think Kieran really does have a stick that he takes to people? And the answer is no. The torture implements, the stick, the shooting, it's all a figure of speech. <laughs> um, the, the, the final thing on different from the expectations is the lack of board oomph. Um, it's just, I think David had a, a far superior board to us. I mean, we have great guys on the board, but there's a degree to which when I describe some of the things we're going through, I knew that I wanted more operational depth on our board, but the money guys said they wanted on the board. Guess what? As I described to them what we were facing with the sales team or with other operational issues or the lack of management issues, this isn't what the finance guys were good at. They just didn't know how to deal with this. Um, and that, that's very frustrating. That wasted time. Great, thanks, Sean. And then I'm going to open it up to questions to the, uh, to the classroom. Um, so I mentioned the one that we, you know we bought it on September 5th, about a week before. Um, basically, the high-end retail market really cratered, and turns out we were in high-end retail. Um, so again, I, one of the things that w that deviated was the uh, the market. And so what that did is we had this great transition plan where I was going to because the. Uh, Basically, the three owners and executive team were stepping out of the business. I was stepping in. And so we're going to have this nice, casual, sort of 100-day plan as I learned the business. Well, that, that, wasn't, that, that was a luxury we no longer had. Um, so that was a big difference. And, and honestly, looking back, these guys said what I would say is that I wish I would have moved faster to make some changes. I kind of knew in my gut were the right things to do. Um, and I, I, you know, I let them linger on because, you know, for one reason or the other, oh, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to go and shoot the person who's been there forever. It could have an impact on the culture. But you know what? You knew it was the right thing to do, and you're looking like I just lost two to three months where I could have been making forward progress. I, so those are things I definitely would would do going forward. Um, that that really is the biggest one. I think you know, on the upside is that we've turned out we've got a, a real brand that we bought. And, you know, when you do diligence, it's really, really hard to figure that out. You can figure out, you know, the balance sheet. You probably find some surprises. But really, is, is that real brand there? So even though, you know, the market's down, our market share's up a lot. So again, I think it's just, you know, you got to adapt. And that's one nice thing about if you've, you know, made some mistakes before, that's experience, um, that you, you feel a bit more confident in adapting when things aren't going as you expected. Great. Thank you for filling those questions. Let's open it up to questions in the in the classroom. Dennis? Uh, have you heard of people who need search funds outside the state? So the question is, I'm going to repeat it for the video. Have you heard of search, people who have done search funds outside of the states? Is that for anyone in particular? Yes. Yes. Can you give two names? 
<laughs> I can come up with them. They're in my they're in my computer somewhere. But uh, they're d before we went out, there'd already been a couple of guys who were um, relatively successful in the UK, um, and since then um, we've heard from multiple folks who wanted to do it in South America and Mexico. So I can get you names. Questions. What do you find in this process that really surprised you about yourself? So that if you look back, you say, wow, that was me doing that? So something really positive? I, I think for me, um, you know, I thought I worked hard and I thought I had been under stress, you know, working for VC backed companies and all that. And, uh, you know, it, it, it went much deeper than I ever anticipated. And so, uh, you know, there were a lot of sleepless nights the first couple of years. And because I really had no choice, you know, I couldn't just walk away. You stuck with it. And, uh, you know, I made it through. And, and I haven't had a sleepless night in a long time. And it's not that necessarily things are easier, but there is this uh, tremendous hill you have to get over. And, and once you get over it, you kind of find out, you know, it's, it's such a cliche, but those things that don't kill you make you stronger, they do. You know, you, you find out, hopefully, you find out that you've got a much, you know, deeper capacity to overcome things than you ever imagined. I think I don't know if you're going there with the, or I don't know if this answers your question directly, but I will tell you that the most rewarding part of the whole thing was my partnership with, with Mike, who's, who's still running the company and who's just a guy I didn't know well before we started doing the search together. And we worked together for about three months before we decided to tell people we were going to raise a fund uh, to try and get to know each other better. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's like anything else in life for me. I think as you do things as a team, the, the highs are just that much higher and the lows are easier to manage. Um, and that was an incredibly rewarding component of it. I got two things. Just um, how little I know or how little I knew. I, last year, I, I, turned 37, and um, I was talking to Joel Peterson about this in the parking lot as well. Basically, and I described, agreed with other business owners on this, there comes a point, it's like, man, I gotta speed up how much I learn. I read more business books now than I ever learned, more on leadership than I've ever read. In addition, the other thing beyond improving on those skills um, is one big skill I needed to learn for running the business was, I ended up taking meditation classes because I, I just couldn't sleep. I mean, just the crap that's waking me at 3 and 4 in the morning, like that frickin' VP of sales, that's where I get language, like I'm going to take you out back and shoot you. It's like at 4 in the morning. Um, that is very zen-like. But, but <laughs> yeah. you, you got to, it's working. It, but it's, it's to Michael's point, it, it was the, it's the level of intensity was quite something. It's like, no, no, are you going to make the debt payment? Or are you going to make the quarter? It's like, oh. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I had to learn a lot. Just one quick one, because this is a great, a great question. I think it, um, we're trying to change the culture and how people work at the company. And so every once in a while, you'll see that person you know is really leveraged. If they decide to jump on board, they make a comment where, like, all those things you've been trying to work on in different ways, because you can't just say it directly. It's coming out of them, and they're being self-directed in a way you'd like it to be. And you're like, you know. That, that's good. So when I do, by the way, I have a piece of paper and pen next to my bed because I wake up so much. I just write it down and at least <laughs> seems to let me go back to sleep. Yep, I did the same thing. <laughs>
people who look at who. I think um, I think that you got to be careful with that idea. I mean, I, I think these are little businesses. I mean, really, to Michael's point, and events get in the way. You know, events whether it's you know customers quitting or even signing up a new customer or employees quitting or what have you. And and I, I think the idea of I've got a great strategy and now I'm just looking for a company to execute against it. Look, if it's a phenomenally powerful strategy, then I guess, you, you know, it can work. But I just think it can be dangerous. You know, you've got to treat each investment as a, you know, it's got to wash its face on its own and it's got to grow on its own. And, and that's hard to do. Um, so, you know, that's not to say, you know, look, if you think that there's a business where there's a set of interesting consolidation to be done or kind of a new set of products to be rolled out that it can't be neat um, and it can't work. But I, I just feel like... Um, you need to know the industry extraordinarily well, and I think it's very easy from the outside to think that things are easy to do strategically and to think that people in the industry just aren't very smart and they haven't thought of it before. And one of the things that continues to astonish me is how incredibly bright people are that found businesses and build them from nothing to real businesses that are making money. And just thinking that you've probably got a smarter idea than them, a lot of the time you don't. There's a reason why they haven't done some of the stuff that's out there. So I just, I, I just be careful, that's all. Thanks. How about you, Victor? Um, you know, so sort of these guys' points, uh, what, what I did is with my two investors is I, I forced myself, ha having been on executive staffs of companies that were venture-backed, I, I sort of tried to force myself to do that sort of reporting. So even though I spent, you know, a lot of emphasis on gaining control and I, I could sort of, you know, tell as much or as little, I suppose, as I wanted, um, I used my investors to force myself to report to them on on monthly, quarterly, annual basis. And uh, so as much as I wasn't necessarily expecting to get a lot of wonderful insight out of them, I, I did use them as a gauge to say, okay, here are the results, here's, here's my strategy, here's what I'm gonna do. And it, it was a, it was a third, third party validation, if you will. Um, so, so ultimately, that's how I approached it. I tried to, to force myself to do the reporting and analysis that is really super difficult to do when you're battling with the day-to-day -day stuff. To just sit down and run a balance sheet and a P&L and analyze it and come up with bullet points of why you're doing something right or wrong is, is, is it's amazingly difficult to find the time. I, I'll start. I was looking to buy a good company with excellent growth potential. So I wasn't looking to, to buy a, you know, a rock bottom company at a rock bottom price. Because um, I, you know, I really do think growth is the, the engine that's going to drive your performance in these type of deals. So um, I was flexible on what that could mean, but that, that was it. And I wanted to buy one that's of a certain size, um, just for me personally. Plus, I think you're. Um, the options you have to, to do different things are better when you're a three million EBITDA company versus a million EBITDA. Yeah, we wanted to build. We wanted to buy a great company at a fair price, and that's you know, that's exactly that. A lot of growth prospects and something that we felt was a. We were perfectly prepared, prepared to pay up for you know, pay a fair price for a great business. Much more important than you buying. Didn't feel like cheap. You're going to make a lot of operational. We wanted one that already was going like this. We just wanted to keep it going like that. That's that's what we were looking for. When I, so there's all the criteria in the books that you know folks talk about. The number one thing we were looking for was growth, and we were looking for multiple ways to win. We had a, a business that was spitting off cash, and there was this little growth piece. Um, I I think that yeah, I think in general these companies are bought cheaply or at low multiples, um, but frequently I think a lot of search funders would agree buy a good company. And some, there was a bit of talk about it not being a very efficient market at the size of these buyouts. I think it's shocking when you actually get out on the field that all these companies or private equity firms that are out saying, we look at companies of five million plus in cash flow, they're down at looking at stuff with one and a half million in cash flow. It's horribly scary at 
what the competition is against you. And Alpine, who's across the street from us, you know, so um, those guys are, they, they got people who are making calls all day long and they're calling the same folks we're calling. It's very, very efficient. So finding a good company is really what you're looking for. And growth is probably the number one criterion that we were looking at. And the one criterion I think we screwed up on was scalability. The original business that we went into, it just couldn't, with the right resources, could not just go like that. Um, it, it just the business we're building has that. One quick comment just on the conversation that was had around, you know, do you make your returns by buying cheap or do you make your returns by, um, you, you know, by growing the heck out of them? And one of the things about the search fund is it's set up that you buy cheap. Um, basically, your investors, you've got to convince a whole bunch of people that this is a good deal, not just one set of people. And, you know, it's your first time buying something and blah, blah, blah. There's a whole bunch of risk, et cetera, et cetera. People aren't prepared to pay up and pay, you know, kind of 10 times EBITDA multiples for a first-time CEO who's doing a change of control deal where the founder CEO is exiting. Um, and that's, to me at least, that's inherently why a lot of search fund deals do look somewhat cheap from a multiple perspective. But I will tell you, I don't think that's what drives the returns. Um, that you'll get a 30% pop or something like that from buying something at four and a half, five times that maybe should go for six or seven these days. That's great. So you made 35%. You want to make a 35% IRR over six years? You've got to keep that going for a long time. Um, but anyway, so I think search deals are just, are they, they are inherently cheap because otherwise your, your equity providers aren't going to be there for you. Questions, Jason. Um, so I guess It, it, it is. I mean, honestly, just going back to the sleepless nights thing, um, you know, doing it alone, uh, I guess, the, on the personal level. Um, if your spouse isn't on board, don't do it. I mean, just, uh, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and, you know, I, I, had, I bought a company, um, conceived our first child. My wife started graduate school at UCSF. And uh, we moved all within 12 months. And um, if it wasn't for my wife and her her parents, just couldn't it just never would have happened. If we, if we didn't have if I didn't have that kind of support at home, and the fact that I had an individual that um, came from an entrepreneurial family, and um, you know grew up with parents that had a deli that was opened 364 days a year and didn't go on vacation with her because they couldn't leave the deli and so she would go on vacation with aunts and uncles. I mean, she got it. She really did. And um, I'm so really, in retrospect, because I, it's not like I chose her for those qualities. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to say I was that prescient. Um, but, uh, but honestly, uh, you know, interview your spouse. I mean, figure out if, you, <laughs> if, 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 if you're in a family environment that, that can do this. Because I, I honestly, we never would have made it through without her personal makeup and then the support of her family helping with uh, the, the two kids that we've, I now have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. And I've owned the company uh, seven years, so do the math. It's uh, you know been impossible without them. So so as far it would have been nice to have a partner. It would have been nice to be able to leave for a week and go on vacation. Uh, I didn't take my first week off until year five. And uh, you know that you know all my all my vacations were you know three day weekends. And so it would have been really nice to have a partner that I felt like I could just. You know, here are the keys. I'll be back in a week. Don't call me. Yeah, I think on the partner side of things, there are also advantages. I mean, to me, the, the, as I said earlier on, I guess, you know, the, the key piece here is making sure if you are going to take the risk, you've got to make sure that you're minimizing it, right? So what are the, you know, bulk, a, a lot of times what ends up happening is you just buy a business that, frankly, doesn't end up being as good as you hoped it was prior to purchasing. And so what are the things that you can do that can ensure prior to 
the acquisition that you've done everything you can to make sure you, you know, you've been honest and, and done as much diligence as you can. And having a partner is a way to do that. It's not the only way to do that. But structurally for us, having a situation where each of us ran our own deals and the other person played a devil's, devil's advocate role and pushed pretty hard and said, I think this business sucks because, and every Friday afternoon, one of the two of us would be on the hot seat explaining what we'd been doing and what the deals were we were working on, and the other person just sat there just chucking rocks at the other guy, basically saying, here's why it sucks. Um, that was a huge source of value for us, for both of us. I mean, it got me, my, my partner was just much better at approaching companies and getting stuff up and running and having a bunch of irons in the fire. And I was great at analyzing each iron that I had perfectly. And that was a total waste of time because the vast majority of the time, nothing happens, right? You're really in the business of saying no when you're doing a search fund, right? You've got to get through the no deals as fast as you can rather than the business of saying yes. And having somebody there who's efficient at helping you run through the no's and doing it quicker and more honestly was, was huge for us. There are other ways to do it, but that was a big deal. I think on running the business, it's great to have a partner. Um, you know, from an emotional and psychic perspective, it's great to, run a, to have a partner. And, you know, the reality is if it's all going to work out pretty well, you have, you have less equity. You have less equity in some of these deals, too. One, one sort of uber comment, I guess, in this thing is you should be doing absolutely everything you can to make sure the transaction is a success. That's the really important thing. Your share thereof, whether it's 10 percent, 15, 20, 30, it's just nowhere near going to matter anyway near as much as that it's a success and not a failure, or it's a home run and not a double. Those are the, those are the things that make all the difference in the world. And so my, my partner took, you know, half the economics that I took, obviously, and that reduced significantly, theoretically, what was available for us in the deal. And I'm the luckiest guy in the world that I did because he added way, way more, you know, from that, whether it's through the deal process or subsequently in running the company than that ever cost me in, in, in my half of the economics in our transaction. I'm going to um, just ask you guys to make closing comments here. And if there's any time until before 6.15, we'll um, take, a, take some last questions. But if you would just focus them, uh, any closing comments you want, any, really anything you want to talk about that we haven't touched on, um, you know, advice for, for people in the class, and, uh, and anything that you would, uh, if you did it over again, if you do differently. That'd be great. And why don't we just go yeah, right well, to left? So one key thing, I mean, I don't expect your investors to act rationally. Um, I, one of the key components of this business I was counting on was one of my investors was supposed to bring me a significant amount of revenue. And I thought, you know, well, maybe I didn't really think about it too clearly. It's like, oh, he's an investor. Of course, that money, will, that revenue will just come. Those sales will just come. And uh, in those first five years, where I took the company from, from $2 million to $3.8 million, um, that had nothing to do with him. And had those dollars come, I, I should have taken that company from 2 to 6 or $7 million. So I guess the one thing is, is you know, anything that you expect, any key assumption, anything you want, is uh, you know, have some teeth, get it in writing, have some contractual obligation that people are going to follow through. And, and, and never, when it comes to investors, assume that, well, they've got equity in the company. They're going to make the same rational decision that you think is rational. And I'm not saying he's acting irrational. There, there, there's a rational method behind it. I've never figured it out. But it's not, it didn't turn out the way I thought. And that was a key thing that I would uh, do differently. Um. If you go this route, focus on getting a great business. The, da David's said this several times in this meeting, in some format, and in other forums. Um, just focus on getting that great business. It makes everything so much easier. Um, then live within your means. Here, you know, whether it's entrepreneurship through acquisition or some other form of entre entrepreneurship, everything goes haywire if you don't get good about your personal financial planning and your needs. Um, and if you're thinking, I'd like to do this in five years, we'll plan for that. Because guess what? In five years, your cash flow is probably going to really suck. Um, so plan. And it, it, if that's really what you want to do in five years, build the financial plan around that and make it happen. Um, and then lastly, on the support item, um, I, there's David and I had partners, but then there's the partners at home. And I don't think there's a statistic in here, but what you start to discover when you call search funders around the country is it's mostly guys and it's mostly married guys uh, because this this reality of you know the company that you're acquiring could be taking you to Knoxville Tennessee which could be great if you're from Knoxville Tennessee and you want to go home to your family but for an Irish and a, an English guy my partner wanted to take me to the middle of Louisiana and I really had to give him a sit down on what that meant um, um, but you've got to build those support mechanisms around you 
You just do. It, it, it's a big undertaking, and you've got to make sure that the people are there who are going to look after you emotionally throughout this process. So um, I, he took my, my bullet because I, my last name's Callahan. We always talk about Team Callahan. That's my wife and I. Um, she has made a lot of sacrifices, you know, so that we could get the experiences we wanted. But I absolutely agree. Cause there's, there's definitely, like, because we could have gone anywhere. Um, and she's from Sydney, Australia, so Knoxville, Tennessee wasn't that appealing to her. Uh, but we agreed up front on what she would and would not do. The, um, yeah, and I just say, think about it as part of your career, not a, you know, one and done and I'm, I'm off to sit on the beach after this. And um, that'll probably make you think about planning it better. And, and as David said, I think I'm just focused on a success. I'm not focused on getting rich off this deal. If I make good money, that, that's obviously a great thing. But, uh, but I want these guys to want to put me in a bigger company the next round. So Sean just took one of mine for sure, which is you got to take it, think about this as part of a 40-year career, not kind of what do you want to do now as soon as you graduate from business school. I just think that's incredibly important in thinking about the sets of skills you want to pick up over the time period of your career as opposed to simply, you know, what do I want to do next month? Um, I, I think the key thing is you got to recognize if this is a path you're going to go down, the odds are it's not going to work. Um, three times out of four, it doesn't. Um, and the other three folks are just as smart uh, as the one where it does. I'm, I'm, I guarantee you. Um, I've seen both, you know, all four of those folks, and they're not that impressive. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you recognize that most of the time it's not going to work, um, if you recognize that most of the time it's not going to work, then you sort of start to say, okay, so, so what does that mean for me? The first thing is you realize that in failure, there are different kinds of failure here. The first, you know, in rank order, the things you want to do are do a great deal, do no deal whatsoever, do a bad deal, right in that order. And, and you want to do everything you can to avoid being in the do a bad deal bucket. And recognize that, frankly, again, most search funders don't succeed in doing that. Uh, it doesn't work out terribly well. But you're going to do everything you can to do that. And, and so that's all around. So your search process, people you get money from, how you think about um, you know, whether or not, which one of these three transactions you go, go through in terms of the structure. For me, there, there's no doubt you would do the funded search if you can. You have an involved, committed, experienced set of people who will help you with diligence. They will help you find deals. They will help you negotiate deals. They will help you find the little Easter eggs that are hidden there inside of the financials or the legal problems. Um, you do everything you can to minimize the chances. You think about a partner if you don't think that maybe you're able to do it yourself and or you're able to run the company well yourself. From a timing perspective, you ask yourself, am I ready today? Am I really ready to put my career on, on the line as a CEO of a business or are there things that I should learn in the interim? Um, and I think you give up control, um, you give up economics, um, you do everything you can to make sure that the deal you're involved in, the deal that you do is a successful one or that you don't do a deal at all. Um, those are the things I think. The final thing I think is, and you're all doing it just by virtue of being here today, but I think it's you try and learn from smart people and the accumulated mistakes of those smart people. And God knows, I mean, I think the CES with Linda um, just does a phenomenal job on capturing as much of the wisdom and the network of folks that are out there. I think the fact that you can get folks like David and Peter teaching this class is just, it's one of the things that makes the GSB an amazing place to be at, that the accumulated wisdom of David and Peter in this process is just, is extraordinary. You guys would be lucky to get time with them if you were thinking of doing a search fund. They're actually here teaching a class. Um, the fact that Jim Ellis is here or what have you. There are so many smart folks that have made most of the mistakes that are necessary in this. And so be wise and learn from those people rather than, you know, try and be smart and make your own mistakes, if you will. Great. Thank you all four very much. <laughs>